So thanks everybody for joining here on uh, what March uh, 24th. Um, you might notice I'm a little bit more uh, relaxed today. I'm actually at home on a staycation, but I figured I'd uh, have time to uh, join in here and, and uh, get the seminar going. Um, one kind of quick note on that of, of logistics and seminar is uh, we do just have three more uh, slots coming up, two of which are filled. Um, so if you're wanting to uh, get in on a seminar spot, um, make sure you uh, send me an email uh, as soon as possible and uh, we can get you in. The last, the last spot that, to fill is, uh, is April 21st. Uh, and then as well, um, another announcement here real quick is uh, tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern, we'll have um, the second of the Center for Geospace Storms uh, Coffee Talks. Uh, which is more of an informal, it's a great way, for, especially for our uh, you know, undergrad or graduate students who are thinking of getting into uh, space science, space weather, uh, kind of academic fields or research fields uh, to talk with um, people who are working in those professions and kind of ask them questions. Um, the first one that they did was really good and really kind of informative of what people are working on and just kind of uh, maybe even small mundane things of like, what's, you know, what's the worst part of getting to where you're at or something like that. So, uh, but otherwise, without any further ado, I'll turn it over to, I think, uh, Nicholas Jones, who's the team lead for the uh, Rocks at X uh, program uh, here at Virginia Tech. Uh, thanks so much for joining us here, Nick, Nicholas. Thanks, Kevin. Thank so, as Kevin just said, my name is Nicholas Jones. I am the team lead for the Rocks at X team here at Virginia Tech. I'm joined by our avionics lead, Danny Flynn, and our mechanical lead, Eric Williams. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about what we do as a team, and then really getting into the design and development of our 2021 payload, which is an ADSB direction finding system. To start it off, I'll talk briefly about what we are as a program. So Rocksat X is a initiative by the Colorado Space Grant Consortium and the NASA's Sounding Rocket Program Office to provide low cost access to space for undergraduate student design teams. And what this sort of looks like is each year we start off in the fall with a design phase where we develop a payload that will fit into a modular payload space with power and telemetry connections going to the sounding rocket to explore some aspect of space science or technology. So we start off with a conceptual design review in October, and this proceeds through to a critical design review in December. The spring semester is mostly focused on the manufacturing, testing, and integration phase, and really culminates in a full mission simulation review. And that's where we as a team are working towards now. Over the summer, we'll be engaging in integration and testing activities in collaboration with the Colorado Space Grant Consortium and the Wallops Flight Facility. And this will all ultimately culminate in launch in early August. To take a quick look at our 2021 team, we are about 20 students strong, organized into an avionics subteam and a mechanical subteam with a couple students also focused on designing some testing hardware, such as a rocket interface simulator and a gravity offload device that we, that we will be using to help us in our full mission simulations. I do wanna take the quick moment to recognize some of the mentorship and support we've gotten both on campus and from industry. So Dr. Kevin Chimpa with the AOE department is our team advisor. We've been receiving RF mentorship from Zach Lefke and Kevin Stern with the Hume Center. And we've also been receiving mentorship from Ben Heckman and Randy Spicer with NGSS, Dr. Bailey with Space at VT, and Dr. Smith, who is a Boeing Technical Fellow who also works with the Calhoun Discovery Program here at Virginia Tech. For a quick overview of our past payloads, we start over here on the left. In 2014, the team was exploring some atmospheric science as well as recording VR uh, virtual reality video footage. In 2015, this team designed and built a 3D printer that actually printed a VT logo during flight. In 2016 and 2017, the team was working on RF engineering projects in similar
by some student experiments. And then we have in the bottom right, our latest uh, payload, the 2020 CubeSat, CubeSat form factor deployable solar array. Uh, unfortunately, the launch last year was canceled. So this payload is currently acting as a backup for our 2021 payload. Moving on to get into the high level look at our 2021 payload, our objective is to develop a direction finding system capable of receiving and recording multiple channels of raw IQ data from ADSB packets while flying aboard a sounding rocket. And if we take a look at our success criteria, specifically the comprehensive set, what we're going to do is record and recover the IQ data for the entire duration of the deployment containing multiple received ADSB packets from four antenna elements. We hope to use this collected data to characterize our direction finder accuracy by comparing the direction finder bearing estimates to the actual signal bearing based on the determined aircraft and rocket positions. On the right, you just see a quick diagram showing our location relative to some of the other university teams flying on the 2021 launch. To take a quick look at the top level system requirements, these really lay out the processes that we need to complete in order to satisfy those comprehensive success criteria, starting with the logging the IQ data. And this is gonna be at a minimum from at least two antenna elements. We'll also be looking to determine the attitude using our own onboard sensors, as well as some of the WFF collected data. And then we'll be using the recorded ADSB signals and attitude data, some of which will be telemetered through the rocket interface back to the Wallops ground station to post-process all that and produce our bearing estimates. The program constraints give a quick look at the sort of scope that we're looking at for our mission. So specifically, our payload weight is limited to 15 plus or minus 0.5 pounds. We're working with a half payload, so we are restricted to less than 5.13 inches in height. And we also have limits set on our power budget at 0.5 amp hours. Similarly, something important for us will be a limit on our deployer speed, which is set to less than one inch per second. And that kind of sets the context of what we're working with. If we take a quick look at our concept of operations, you can see that we plan to turn on our systems about three minutes before launch. This will provide enough time to let ev everything initialize and begin collecting data. At around T equals 85 seconds after launch, around an altitude of 75 kilometers, we'll begin our antenna array deployment. And this will carry through all the way through Apogee, which we expect to be around 150 kilometers this year, to about 300 seconds after launch. So around three, four minutes of collecting data. At this point, our antenna array will retract and hopefully everything will be stowed away before experiment power off about 40 seconds later. And then at about 900 seconds after launch, the rocket and the payload section will splash down into the Atlantic and then our payload will be hopefully able to be recovered. So now I'm gonna hand it off to Danny, who's gonna get into a little bit of the background of our mission, as well as the avionics systems. All right, uh, thanks so much for that intro and uh, description of our program, Nick. Um, so I'm gonna be diving a little bit into the uh, technical details of our project, uh, as well as explain our, our problem a little bit more. Um, so I'm Danny Flynn, I am our avionics team lead. Uh, avionics encompasses everything electrical and uh, RF. So, uh, you know, I pretty much deal with setting requirements, uh, coming up with the overall design, contributing to systems engineering, uh, you know, from a high level, um, right. So uh, to get into our problem a little bit more, I think there's a little bit more background information you should know. Um, first one is, uh, what is ADSB? Uh, ADSB is Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, and essentially it's just aircraft positioning packets. Uh, you know, every so often, uh, I'll pretty much every new aircraft has to broadcast its position with this signal. Um, and we're trying to capture those signals so we can A, uh, decode them and determine the true angle from 
uh, the rocket to those uh, aircraft, and B, uh, determine and estimate using an antenna array uh, to those aircraft. Um, so with that, uh, I guess the, you know, the, the problem is uh, we want to know where a radio signal is coming from. That's what we're looking at. Um, and the solution is to employ a technique called direction finding. Um, so direction finding is just uh, figuring out the angle that the signal is coming from. It's as simple as that. Um, and to do that, uh, there is some hardware that we're going to need. Uh, the first piece of hardware that we're going to need is uh, some antennas. Uh, we're going to need a multi-channel receiver. Uh, and that receiver, uh, that radio receiver, is going to have a very important uh, constraint. It has to be phase coherent. Uh, and I'll explain what that means a little bit uh, in a few minutes. Uh, and then we're going to need some sort of signal processor to actually do uh, both the decoding and do the angle of arrival estimation. Um, and for that, uh, the signals are being decoded. The ADSB signals are actually being decoded by our onboard flight computer, while the angle of arrival estimate is going to take place after the mission is over and after we recover our payload, get all of our data back. Um, we're going to do that just on, uh, you know, plain old computer using MATLAB. Right. Um, so to dive into some more technical backgrounds, uh, next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit about antennas. Um, so you can do multiple PhDs on this topic. I'm an undergrad, so if I say something slightly uh, wrong, please forgive me. But um, you know, basic concept is an antenna is a device that it's a transducer that converts, converts electrical signals to electromagnetic signals, and vice versa. Um, there are lots of shapes and sizes: uh, patch antennas, wire antennas, uh, reflector antennas. Um, and there's a couple considerations that are important um, when we are going to select our antenna for this purpose. Um, the first one is our resonant frequency. Uh, that pretty much just means the uh, frequency that our antennas are tuned to. Uh, and we can quantify this uh, using uh, kind of one same value that kind of goes by a couple different names. They're all very similar. Uh, I call it the reflection coefficient. Uh, if you've taken anything uh, related to transmission lines, you'll have uh, known about the gamma parameter. It's your reflection coefficient. Uh, and call it the return loss, the S11 parameter. Um, that gives us a good measure of the frequency that our antenna is resonating at. Now, ADSB is at uh, 1090 megahertz or 1.09 gigahertz. Uh, so we want to make sure that our antenna is resonating right at 1090 megahertz. Uh, next thing is radiation pattern. Uh, now, the radiation pattern of an antenna is kind of a measure of how um, narrowly directive or omnidirectional the antenna is. So, um, for example, uh, I think it's best to explain with an example. With a big parabolic reflector antenna, you point it at one direction, and that's the direction your signal's going. Uh, whereas with something like a uh, you know one of those extendable antennas that you might use for an FM radio or the antenna on top of your car, that's going to be more omnidirectional. Um, and at the most basic level, like that means you can receive or transmit a signal in any direction. Um, and on the left, uh, you can see some pictures of the uh, radiation pattern of a uh, dipole antenna. Um, it's pretty close to uh, what we call isotropic. Isotropic means radiating equally in all directions. It's impossible to physically realize that, but this, uh, this donut shape, um, and that is the, uh, what we call the azimuth and the elevation cut of this antenna pattern. Um, it's visible on the left there. So the radiation pattern of a dipole is very close to omnidirectional, right? Um, gain, uh, gain ties into uh, your radiation pattern a little bit. Um, if you have a more omnidirectional antenna, it's going to have a lower peak gain, but that gain is going to be about equal in all directions. Whereas if you have, you know, like a parabolic reflector or very directive antenna, like a horn, uh, it might have a very high gain, but it only has that high gain uh, in one specific direction and, you know, going out from that, that direction. Um, lastly, uh, what we want to consider is the polarization of our antenna. Um, the polarization just refers to uh, the direction of the electric field vector um, in your electromagnetic wave. So for ADSB, they're being transmitted by aircrafts that have uh, vertically oriented wire antennas on them. So uh, it's vertically polarized. So we want our received antennas, the ones that we're designing and building, to also be vertical to match that ADSB vertical polarization. Right. Um, so that's our, our background on antennas. Um, moving on to the actual direction finding um, or the angle of arrival detection. Uh, what I have here is like a super oversimplified example of how that works. Um, 
So given that you know the distance between at least two receiving antennas, so the two antennas or more that are on our platform, on our rocket, um, and if you know, uh, backtrack a second, if you have a, uh, an electromagnetic signal coming from some unknown direction, um, let's say you know, it's, it's coming from very far away, um, if the wave is sufficiently planar, uh, it means that the, you know, if you think of it as the, the source of your, your wave is a very far way away, uh, you know, once it radiates out, big, big sphere, it's radiating out, uh, once it gets to you, the, you know, what you see looks like a plane. Um, given those assumptions, you can actually just use some basic trig to uh, calculate the angle that the signal is coming from. Um, so that's what this is right here. It's an example of with two elements um, and a plane, a plane wave, an electromagnetic plane wave coming at those elements. Uh, we know the distance between our antennas. Uh, and then using some mathematical techniques, you can use a uh, cross correlation actually to figure out a common characteristic in the signal and then figure out the difference between when that signal arrives at one element and the other element, that delta T and a velocity, the velocity is just the speed of light in the medium that your wave is propagating. Uh, you figure out that angle theta that the signal is coming from. Uh, now, again, uh, this is super oversimplified. If you're an ECE major and you take ECE 2804, you can actually do it this way with audio signals. There's a direction finding pro uh, project in that class. It's the one I did, it was super fun. Um, but in practice for radio direction finding, more advanced algorithms that can do things like take into account that there might be multiple signals or you know, other complex uh, scenarios, take all that into account um, and use more advanced algorithms to find the angle of arrival. Um, so lastly, on our background theory, uh, earlier I mentioned that one of the requirements of our uh, receiver radio system is that it has to be uh, phase coherent. Now, what we mean by that is that, um, let's say, for example, uh, you have a, you know, you have, you have, you have a sinusoid or a, a carrier frequency just going into all your antennas and the, the distances, uh, you know, the distance that each one, on India backtracking a second again. Um, phase coherent essentially means that um, there's no phase offset caused by any of the components from in between where your antennas are and where your uh, ultimate like radio receiver is. Um, because the phase, the phase offset between each channel is actually what you use to measure the time of arrival at each element. So we just want to make sure that uh, that phase offset isn't being caused by anything like, oh, uh, this coax cable is longer than this one. So to achieve that, we have to uh, just make sure that we, uh, we measure the propagation delay of all of our components. And we can actually run a, uh, a cross-correlation algorithm on startup where we just put a carrier wave into all your channels and make sure everything aligns. Uh, then you can actually do the direction finding because then you know that the phase is coming, the phase offset is coming from the signal arriving at uh, different times at each element. Okay, so now given all that background knowledge, um, and again, uh, you know, I simplified a lot of things. Um, I'm an undergrad, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. Um, we came up with this electrical design. Um, this is our functional block diagram. It's an overview of what our system looks like. Uh, so to briefly explain this, um, I'll start with all the, the radio uh, subsystem stuff. I'll go into our flight computer, talk about our power and our sensors. So starting at the bottom right, um, all of our RF hardware uh, minus one board that I'll talk about is actually out on our deployer outside of our electronics box. Um, so uh, we have our four dipole antenna element or uh, antenna elements um, centered at 1090 megahertz uh, each on each channel. Uh, the radio signal will pass through there uh, through what's called a ballon, uh, which helps with like current and impedance matching uh, through a bandpass filter. A bandpass filter makes sure that we're attenuating noise that is out of the band of interest around 1090 megahertz. And uh, then through uh, a low noise amplifier, an LNA. Uh, so we're amplifying the signal uh, so we can you know look at it in more detail uh, through to our Edis E310 software-defined radios. Uh, software-defined radios are awesome because they allow all this flexibility for us to, um, you know, pretty much 
do a lot of what you might have to do in hardware, just in software, like for example, decoding the ADSB packets. Um, so uh, once we collect all that data, um, now you know we, we call this IQ data, that's just the raw signal, we're recording it. On those radios, we are piping over that data uh, via a TCP socket on each of the radios through a network switch over to our flight computer. Now our flight computer consists of an Odroid N2 Plus single board computer. Um, if you know, if you ever use a Raspberry Pi, you know what a single board computer is. This is just a very overpowered Raspberry Pi and it's about $80. Um, send all of our data into there and then do whatever processing we need to do. Make sure we're saving it to uh, the EMMC uh, storage device on there. And then uh, sending over 16 bit uh, parallel telemetry through the rocket interface back down to the ground uh, to you know save as much data as we can that way. Um, also on our flight computer is a microcontroller, the MSP432. Very, again, a very common microcontroller that you even get to use in some of the EE classes here. Um, with that, we're actually collecting a whole bunch of other data um, from our payload sensors. Uh, we're controlling uh, when our motors need to actuate uh, to actually deploy our antenna array. And we're also controlling um, one last little thing. It's a uh, pin puller. Uh, we call it for a pin puller circuit. It's a little motor that pulls out a pin from the deployer to inhibit its motion until we want it to move out. Right. Um, so all those sensors, temperature sensors, a camera, um, an IMU is an inertial measurement unit. Uh, a high range accelerometer so we can gauge the launch forces and a barometer uh, pressure sensor. So if the electronics box depressurizes for some reason, we know if that happened. Um, sending all that to the MSP 432, some of it gets sent to the ground via analog telemetry um, and some of it is, or all of it rather, is saved to a micro SD card as well. Uh, lastly, we have our power distribution system. Uh, this is just a bunch of buck and uh, linear uh, down converters. So we get 28 volts from the onboard batteries on the rocket. We have to convert that down to the 12 volts, 5 volts, 9 volts, and 3.3 volts that we actually want to use uh, for our system. Right. So moving on, uh, now we have some actual uh, pictures of this stuff. Um, I've elected to kind of skip over some of the more detailed design of subsystems in favor of this, just because I think it's more interesting to look at the final hardware. Um, this is our RF systems. So uh, top image, you can see our uh, E310 software-defined radios. You can see our network switch. You can see the Odroid. Uh, and you can see an Arduino. That Arduino is just a test device uh, to test the 16-bit uh, parallels to make sure that it's being sent from the Odroid properly. Uh, go down an image, and you see our antenna elements and RF front end, as well as that other uh, PCB that I told you about earlier. Um, that is called. Uh, our bias T circuitry. Um, now, what that means is since, remember earlier I said that all of our RF front end is out actually at the deployer. Um, now the, the amplifier um, on, you know, the LNA on that RF front end needs to receive DC power. Uh, and the way that we do that is rather than sending another cable with the right um, uh, with the right power, uh, you know, kind of floating in, you know, I guess be floating in space between our electronics box and out on the deployer. Uh, we just run the DC power over the coax cables that also carry the RF signal. Um, and we can do that with uh, a bias T circuit. Um, so that purple board there has our bias T circuitry uh, and some uh, voltage regulators on it. We're just making sure that we get that DC power out to the LNA where it's needed. Um, our antenna elements actually are made of tape measures. Uh, Believe it or not, that's a super common thing to do in this kind of thing. I didn't know that until I, uh, we started this project and we received some advice from our mentors. Uh, top right, that's the uh, CAD of the RF front end PCB. And bottom right, that is the bias T circuitry hooked up to one of our antenna, element, antenna elements, which is then uh, hooked into our radios. Right. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is kind of our command control and data acquisition system, or our, our sensors board. Uh, stacked on top of the Odroid. So uh, remember earlier, I said we have a couple different sensors. Um, we have, uh, you, you know, I won't go through all of it in super detail, but we have our three axis accelerometer to measure launch forces. We have that pressure sensor uh, to detect electronics box depressurization if that happens. We have our inertial measurement unit, which also includes a temperature sensor to both get the temperature inside of the box during flight and to record the rocket attitude. 
And then we have that uh, RGCAM camera and that just, uh, excuse me, that just records the deployer uh, going in and out. At least that's the goal of it. Yep. Um, that MSP432 is soldered surface mount onto this PCB. I'm super proud of one of our members. His soldering skills are just way beyond anything I could ever do. Um, <laughs> and then we have those uh, sensor breakout boards on there as well. Um, the sensors board also serves as a pass through for the 16 bit telemetry uh, that's coming from the Odroid. So you can see on the left, we have a, uh, I think that's 40 pins coming from the Odroid. Uh, go right through in here, this stacks right on top. Uh, some traces route that through to our 50 pin D sub connector that you can see there, uh, which handles all of the electrical connections uh, that go from inside the box to outside of the box. So that's our power in from the rocket interface. That's our telemetry in and out from the rocket interface. That's also our motors. Uh, that's how we program the MSP 432. Um, and that's all of our sensors that are outside the box as well. Right. Um, so finally, the last subsystem I'll show you uh, is our power supply. Um, again, super proud of our members for making this. Uh, this is our 2021 power supply. It's on its own PCB, completely custom. Um, it's using some, a combination of uh, switched mode buck converters, as well as some uh, just some linear regulators to give us uh, two 12 volt DC rails. I should say B, not V. Uh, nine volt rail, five volt rail, and 3.3 volt rail. Powers our various sensors, it powers our radios, it powers our Odroid. Um, everything we can need is right there. Um, and the CAD and the actual board look really cool. <laughs> right. uh, jumping a little bit into software, um, this is kind of a block diagram overview of our telemetry software. Um, it's just highlighting the data flow, um, where our ADSB packets are going. Uh, they go through the Odroid. They're all saved to local storage. And some of the decoded packets are sent uh, to 16-bit parallel down to the ground uh, while we're in flight. Our IMU, barometer, temperature, sensors, um, and accelerometer uh, all sent into the MSP 432. Um, we do, uh, you know, the MSP has an onboard um, ADC that's sampling those. Uh, some of them are use uh, some other interfaces like I squared C as well. Uh, and then we send that back out through a DAC to the analog lines um, on the rocket interface. Um, and then finally, just some of our data is getting stored to an SD card. And all of this is implemented in a combination of um, I won't say embedded C because we actually found a way around that. <laughs> um, we're using something called Energia, which lets you write uh, AVRC uh, on the MSP 432 uh, and some Python scripts for the Odroid and some lower level C to control some of the uh, more precise timing that's required for the 16-bit parallel. Right. Um, Yep, so that's not all the software that we have. We have all this uh, digital signal processing software as well. Um, and we do that with uh, a framework called GNU Radio. Um, GNU Radio is awesome because it lets you uh, connect together all these different modular Python blocks uh, without actually having to write any code. Uh, you just can connect things together. Um, like, for example, um, uh, on this, th this is an example flow graph of how we're sending data from the radios to the flight computer via TCP socket. Um, you know, you can just drag and drop in uh, multipliers, uh, AGCs, automatic gain control. Um, you can put in these uh, frequency syncs, so that shows us a live uh, FFT or Fourier transform, the spectral domain of what we're receiving, um, and then. There's even uh, ADSB decoders that we didn't even have to write because someone already made them for GNU Radio. So uh, super awesome framework, super simple to use, and we took as much advantage of it as we could uh, for this project. Right. Um, yeah, uh, so so lastly, I have, I have two more slides before I hand it off to Eric to talk about the mechanical stuff. Um, this is a uh, link budget, or a, rather a geographic link budget of um, taking all of the assumptions uh, from our hardware design, um, uh, a link budget is something that you perform when you want to figure out, uh, for example, like what kind of data rates you're getting, uh, you know, in a communications link or uh, what your signal to noise ratio looks like, what your received power looks like. Um, there's a whole bunch of outputs you can get, but the general concept still applies that you're taking your, uh, your gain assumptions from your hardware, you're taking your loss assumptions from things like uh, free space loss, from atmospheric attenuation, from uh, rain fade. You're taking all that into account and you're determining uh, ultimately the signal to noise ratio at your receiver. Uh, so for this, uh, we found this uh, International Telecommunications Union uh, recommendation on, it's actually on receiving ADSB 
in space. Um, and we took a bunch of hardware assumptions for what the uh, aircraft that are going to be transmitting these signals uh, are using, uh, plugged that into our, our link budget. Um, we took our hardware assumptions. So we used like uh, initially we used the uh, free, I think it's the free uh, equation to figure out like what our uh, cumulative gain and noise figure looks like um, on our analog RF front end, uh, plugged that into it, plugged in the distance between um, where we assume the rocket is going to be and every single possible location that a plane could be. And we do a link budget and we get this as the output, um, but there's one extra step. Um, Normally, you just do a link budget. You're assuming it for two fixed locations. Uh, I guess the, the next step that we added in here is we assumed the position of the rocket. We assume that the rocket is about at Apogee, uh, 150 kilometers above uh, approximately where Wallops Island, Virginia is. But then uh, on the other end of that link budget, um, so this factored into like calculating the uh, free space loss, uh, the attenuation of just you know the signal spreading out over a long distance. Um, we took a big geographic region uh, that we calculated by first determining the radio horizon uh, of our uh, receiver system when the rocket's at Apogee. That just means like how far can you see before the Earth's curvature gets in the way. Uh, we took that big, ge big geographic region, split it into uh, cells, and then we ran a link budget between every single cell uh, just in a big for loop uh, in MATLAB. And using the mapping toolbox, we were able to spit that out and get these nice contour lines. This is our assumed signal to noise ratio versus the geographic region. Um, and I'm super proud of the team for coming up with this as well. Right. Um, and my last slide before I hand it off to Eric, uh, this is what the uh, version one of our uh, final integrated avionics hardware looks like. Um, so quick recap going up from bottom up, we have our Odroid single board computer stacked on top of that. We have our sensors board stacked on top of that. We have our power board, and finally our RF bias T board on the top. Um, it fits right inside of our electronics box. Eric will show you a uh, fit check in the 3D printed prototype. I just saw some pictures today of the first iteration of the uh, actual electronics box being manufactured. Uh, we casted it out of aluminum. It's a super cool shape. Um, and yep, uh, I guess thanks for listening to my part. Uh, you know, I could talk about this stuff all day, um, but. My time is up, so Eric, please take it away and talk about the mechanical aspects of our project. Yes, so the uh, job of the mechanical uh, sub team is to make all of that a reality, uh, beginning that to actually fit into our form factor, uh, which is a 12 inch diameter uh, by five inch tall cylinder. Uh, and the issue here, uh, or particular challenge of this uh, payload is that the antenna array elements must be precisely 13.75 centimeters apart uh, at full deployment so that they can be uh, phase coherent. So in order to, uh, yeah, and that also needs to be completely clear of the, uh, of the rocket body since that will interfere uh, drastically with the, uh, with the quality of the signal that we're receiving. And if you can do some quick math and some unit conversions, uh, you can see that uh, we cannot fit the four elements on, to on top of that payload space. So uh, uh, next slide. We, ha we went with a telescopic uh, boom in order to uh, guarantee that the placements of each antenna element is uh, correct in relation to each other. Uh, we are uh, also custom casting an, electro an electronics box to minimize the potential uh, uh, points of failure for water ingress upon landing, as well as uh, to allow for the large uh, telescopic boom assembly that is mounted down the middle of the payload. And in order to keep the, uh, the deployer in check, uh, we have a hold down release mechanism since we are using a stepper motor, uh, which can spin while unpowered. And in order to keep, uh, we have to run cables out to each antenna element at deployment. So we also have a special uh, cable storage system to keep them contained on the way up. Next slide. Here is a, a CAD overview. Uh, you can see the four uh, deployer ele uh, deployed elements each at the end of a telescopic assemb uh, assembly. Uh, that puts them at their uh, prescribed distance while also keeping them clear of the body. You can see the uh, 
Electronics Box actually has an overpass segment uh, that passes over the deploying uh, cylinders. And the cable storage system is located to each side, which then you can run the wires out to the um, each of the assemb uh, assembly pieces. And the drive motor is driving a yet another tape measure, which is serving as the pushing element for deployment. Next slide. Here's an internal look at the layout of these and uh, the tubes. You can see the outer ring at each level uh, contains the platform for the deploy uh, for the antenna elements uh, while an inter internal collar uh, catches at each level to prevent uh, everything from falling apart. Uh, the last uh, the last tube you can see the two hatch marks on it uh, on, on the smallest tube uh, that is the pushing uh, platform for the deploy uh, or for the actual uh, tape measure that is uh, pushing down the tube. Next slide. Uh, here's uh, a few videos of uh, deployment. You can see uh, it does sag a little. Uh, we're that is because of uh, gravity. We will be testing using the aforementioned uh, so or gravity offload device, uh, but. Uh, yeah, that, that has not been uh, captured on video, but it is able to pull in or push out and pull in. OK, next slide. Uh, here's a, another view of our of the more or of the complex side of this uh, of this payload. You can see the uh, D sub pass through that was on the electronics board. Uh, this is, there's wires running from the uh, board to here, and then uh, from here goes out to all of the various electronic components. Uh, each of the coax cables that fe feed into the antennas uh, have their own uh, coax cable uh, pass-throughs, uh, and those are on the side of the electronics box. Uh, the hold down release mechanism here uh, inserts a pin uh, close to the center of the uh, of the actual uh, drum that is holding the uh, tape measure in it, and there are also two uh, the locations for two physical interrupts to disconnect the motors when we don't want them to go places. Next slide. Okay, here's some uh, views of what how things are set up inside. Uh, the overpass portion of the electronics box is used for a network switch, which allows uh, for the single board computer uh, to talk to the uh, software defined radios, uh, since there is a mismatch in the number of uh, network cables that can pass between them. Next slide. OK, so one particular uh, area that we need to be very concerned is the payload weight, uh, since we are limited to 15 pounds. Uh, here's a breakdown of those as of now. Uh, and based on how things uh, uh, all level out at the end of this process, we can uh, we have an adjustable ballast system uh, in order to uh, deal with any unforeseen issues. Next slide. Uh, here's some uh, preliminary se uh, setups. The one on the right is without any ballast, and the one on the left is. Uh, with some uh, ballast applied. You can see that even in this setup, it is still relatively uh, close to the middle. Next slide. All right. That's, that's my time done. So thank you, Eric and Danny, for going through the avionics mechanical systems. As we look to close out our presentation for today, I just wanted to outline some of the steps that we will be taking moving forward. So currently the team just went through integrated subsystem testing review and we're currently moving into full mission simulations where we'll be finishing manufacturing and then integrating everything together to show full operation of the payload. We'll be shipping the payload out on May 1st to Colorado Space Grant Consortium in order to initiate a lot of that summer testing. And that's gonna involve ground testing at Colorado Space Grant 
and then integration testing at Wallops flight facility. And this involves things like sequence testing, RF interference testing, vibrations, and then post vibration sequence testing. And hopefully, if everything goes well with our further steps, we'll be launching in early August. I just want to take this slide to go ahead and acknowledge some of our sponsors and other organizations that have offered us things like mentorship to the team. And that's been key to us really succeeding this year, despite all the difficulties we faced. And then this is all we have today for our presentation, but we'll go ahead and open up for questions if anyone has any. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks, Nicholas and Danny and, and Eric. Um, maybe maybe I'll lead off with one. Um, that, that was going to be my question is kind of where you guys are at and um, you know, what's the next couple of steps? I was going to, one thing that thinking of that, um, maybe is just a, a, as a share of sort of the process, um, uh, what was, do you think was one of the more difficult things, um, that you think you kind of overcame during this last, or kind of one of the more challenging parts, I guess, uh, is another way to think about it of this last, uh, review that you, I think you just had it last week, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so what was kind of one of the more challenging things or more difficult things you think you kind of overcame uh, for the, for that review? Let's see, Danny, do you want to talk about uh, avionics trouble? And then, Eric, do you want to talk about a mechanical one? Sure, yeah. I think there's, there's a couple things I can think of off the top of my head uh, that were particular dif particularly difficult and that we've kind of resolved recently. Um, so uh, one one big problem that we were having was actually with just the uh, the – the 16-bit parallel telemetry. Um, so it, it turns out that, uh, so how that works is you have 16 data bits and you have one strobe bit. The strobe bit is essentially a clock that's sending pulses uh, from the ro uh, rocket interface. Uh, it turns out that our Odroid was not able to detect those, uh, there were, I think, one microsecond pulses. Um, so what we had to do uh, was come up with some way to you know, get it to detect those. Um, and what we came up with, uh, what one of our members came up with rather was a uh, kind of a, a timer extension circuit. There was this one IC found, uh, you pretty much control the timing with, um, with an, you know, an RC pair, um, little RC circuit. And then uh, based on the, the time constant of that, it'll keep a signal uh, at a constant voltage high for a longer period of time than, uh, you know, than, initially was detected. And that way, uh, we could extend it to, you know, five microseconds, 10 microseconds, and the Odroid was able to read uh, that telemetry. So we retested and we were, you know, able to send data again and receive data. Um, other stuff, uh, something, you know, some of the really challenging stuff towards the beginning uh, was just, you know, even, even figuring out like what radio platform we wanted to go with. Um, so we knew that uh, you know, we knew that we were going to need multiple channels. There were a couple of different approaches. Uh, one idea was even just doing it completely in hardware without uh, software-defined radios. But you know, ultimately, we came up uh, to this decision. Um, I, I think there's some there's some some other mechanical stuff I can think of uh, that you know we figured out along the way. But I guess we'll let Eric talk about that. If you have anything you wanted to share, yeah, I guess. Yeah, one, I guess one of the long running things, at least on mechanical, is just uh, yeah, dealing with uh, COVID restrictions. So that has been a real challenge across uh, this development cycle since uh, even in our lab space, we're limited to three people maximum at the moment. And they have and they're operating in, and we're operating in three person pods. So that uh, not being able to collaborate face to face on some, especially the mechanical elements, is a challenge. But I think we've worked through that. One of the big things uh, in general, in general, has also been uh, the deployment system. That has been uh, several kinds of headaches. First, getting it to fit, and then uh, getting all the components to agree with each other, because uh, we're working with, especially with the deployment tubes. Uh, those are we're using we're using uh, prefabricated uh, fiberglass tube uh, tubing that was sold as uh, for the purpose of uh, telescoping tubes, but 
in a completely different context with different fittings. Uh, so we're ha getting that system to work uh, was a challenge. Yeah, very good. Yeah, very good. Yeah, it's always just a curious, and I, I say, you know, folks have seen there, I, I was uh, involved with this a little bit towards the fall semester, but I've kind of fallen out of it. So it's good to see kind of the circle back and see what you guys have made of made of things. But um, yeah, we have a few others on here. Any other questions uh, you want to ask of the uh, of the team here? Don't you have the flight video if you want? Oh yeah, to show that. Um, if everyone wanted to take a look, so I think this is launch, but this was a video we recorded, or the team recorded on a 2018 flight, and so pretty soon. Yep. So this is just after the cover ejectable skin comes off the rocket. If you look closely, you should be able to see two objects get deployed. One there, and I think the other one just went. Those were the two student satellites um, that are being tested on that year's payload. You can kind of see that uh, bit of string that's sticking out. That is a little bit of burn wire that was keeping those in. And now the attitude control system of the rocket has kicked in and stabilized that view. And so it's very pretty. Um, great for producing pro promotional pictures for the team. <laughs> you got a chat question? Yeah, I'm sure too, before you get to that, I'm sure that was good too for uh, the program and wallops and all that too. So. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. So we but have yeah, a question in chat. What was the design loading for the telescoping arm? Do launch accelerations factor into the mechanical design? Uh, Eric, yeah. if you want to talk about this. Yes. Uh, can you bring up the like the vibrational testing slide? Yes. OK. So yeah, d the design loading, uh, this is what we have to design to withstand. This is the testing. It's a little more aggressive than what we expect to see. Uh, but this is these tests are in the sort of shake it really hard and see if what falls off uh, sort of testing uh, to make sure that you have everything locked down properly. You can see we're going up to uh, 10 to 20 G, uh, Gs of acceleration, which makes sense with the rocket that we're using since it is literally two solid rocket motors off of uh, a surface to air missiles stacked on top of each other uh, to get us all the way up. Uh, but yeah, so launch accelerations do take into account the uh, loading. Uh, the telescopic arm is in its stowed configuration for the for the way up and is inhibited from uh, spinning alongside the uh, um, the spin stabilization uh, that they use to keep it on track. So, yeah, so it, it is designed uh, to work under freefall conditions and it is uh, held very secure, uh, very securely and um, and braced properly to not uh, be chucked too far around uh, on the way up. And since all since this is a relatively short flight and it gets rather melted on the way down, it's not uh, all this. Just everything on this is designed uh, to operate for at least uh, the uh, the for or the way all the way up and through the experimentation period. It's less of a concern if things start breaking on the way down. All right, so Dylan says, awesome, thanks. It's always good to, to get the response and uh, feedback. So uh, yeah, any other, any other questions uh, that anybody else has here? And feel free to, to put them in the chat or anything too. Going once, going twice. Uh, one other question I had is just a general, more uh, programmatic or kind of high level uh, thing. If, if uh, folks watching this uh, kind of want to get involved, uh, not necessarily, it's probably what a little late for 
getting involved in, in this one, but maybe for the, uh, what, 2022 uh, launch, how, uh, how might they do that? Right. So we typically recruit for our team at the very beginning of the fall semester. And we send those recruitment emails out through the department listservs. So yeah. AOE, ECE, ME, a couple of others. Um, yeah. That's the best way for to catch those applications. And yeah, and the specific time frame is usually uh, from like uh, w on campus welcome week into the first uh, first week of classes, and then from that point we start doing interviews. Very cool. Well, thank you very much, uh, Eric, Danny, and, and Nicholas. Thank you very much for presenting. Um, and uh, I say just a reminder to, uh, tomorrow we'll have the uh, Center for Geospace Storms uh, coffee talk and then um, at 4 p.m. And then otherwise we'll have a seminar in uh, two weeks time. Uh, and then anybody else that wants to grab that last slot uh, there at the end of April, uh, feel free to email, email me and uh, we can get you in. So thank you guys very much and everyone have a good day. Thanks thank for you having for having us. us. Thank you.